between virtue epistemology and education. Um, that topic is something I'm really interested in. Uh, this semester, I'm teaching an upper division class in philosophy for undergraduates, and it's sort of our methods class where we teach students how to write philosophy papers and help them uh, learn how to argue as a philosopher. And the topic rotates. So this semester, I chose the topic of intellectual virtue in education. And one of the things that we're doing in that class is we're going across the street to a public elementary school and working with sixth graders on how to become more open-minded and intellectually courageous. Um, so these projects um, matter to me personally, and I think matter in the world. I think um, that if we could figure out ways to encourage intellectual virtue in classrooms, both um, at the elementary level and maybe in high school, high school's a tough crowd, I don't know, but also, also at the university level, I, uh, this paper is really about what to do at the university level, I think that would be really awesome. Um, and just one other thing I want to mention in this regard, so um, one of our colleagues, uh, Jason Baer, who teaches at Loyola Marymount University, he, um, as part of a John Templeton Foundation project, um, was a group of people who established a school called the Intellectual Virtues Academy, which is a public charter school in Long Beach, California, that teaches, I believe, fifth and sixth graders. Um, and they're expanding, and they're hopefully going to try to turn it into a high school as well. So just to have, just so you all have that sort of thing on your radar. Um, so this paper is about, um, it's really about reflecting on how to introduce discussions of and potentially acquisition of responsibleist virtues in logic and critical thinking classes at the university level. So every university has you, uh, at least one logic class. In the state of California where I teach, logic and critical thinking gets sort of separated. So logic is for the formal symbolic side, and critical thinking is for the informal side. Um, so this paper is about things that we could do as philosophy faculty in logic and critical thinking classes explicitly to try to help our students not just acquire really important reliableist virtues like the skills of logic and critical thinking, but also acquire responsibleist virtues like being open-minded and intellectually courageous and intellectually humble and so Okay, so that's what this is about. Now, the, I think the papers posted on the conference website, so I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Um, we're going to do some fun stuff. And I hope you're going to participate. <laughs> so uh, what I want to do is I'm just going to read the intro so you guys can sort of see what the overall shtick of the paper is. Then I'm going to skip to the last section, which is about um, activities I've actually used in some of my classes. And we're going to, hopefully you will be willing to participate. We're going to go through some of these activities and see how it goes, OK? Um, so, I think it matters whether the arguments we make are valid or invalid, and strong or weak, and we want to develop and help our students develop the skills of conductive and inductive reasoning. Why? Well, because such skills are conditionally reliable. They make it likely that we're going to get truths, and that matters. I think it's clear that that matters. So, skills of logic are one. One kind, one, one kind of paradigm of intellectual virtue, reliableist virtues, and they, I think reliableist virtues, largely get their value from the value of the good effects that they're producing. So truth is valuable, so what gets us truth is valuable. Knowledge is valuable, so if reliableist virtues get us knowledge, reliableist virtues are valuable. Although that's true. There's a lot of literature on how that works, exactly. Um, so to be a reliableist virtue, equality must consistently produce good intellectual effects. And any quality that does that, roughly, within the kinds of parameters we've already talked about within the last couple of days, counts as a reliable virtue. Um, 
So I think universities already care about reliableness virtues, right? They already prize truth, they prize reliability, they're already committed to helping students develop logical skills. So gen general education curricula, I don't know about the UK, but general education curricula in the US, pretty much students are required to take logical critical thinking at any university that they attend. Um, that was not always taught by a philosophy department. Um, but universities have not systematically addressed whether and how to help students develop character traits like open-mindedness. Such character traits are important not just because they're likely to get truths, but because they also involve something else that's valuable intellectually, the motivation for truth. Um, getting truths matters, but we can get truths simply because we want good grades. Right? Um, or an award, or bragging rights, and not because we actually care about getting the truth for its own sake. Caring about truth for its own sake also matters in addition to getting the truths. Um, so I think we want our students to be the sort of people who care more about truth than they do about getting good grades, or about winning an award, or about being right. Um, and caring about truth for its own sake isn't required by logical skills, right? But it is a requirement of character traits like having intellectual humility or being open-minded. Um, and those are paradigms of responsiblest virtue. We've said a little bit about that as well in the last couple of days. Um, we can think of responsiblest virtues as intellectual analogs of Aristotelian moral virtues. So their disposition is good intellectual motivation, like caring about truth, um, appropriate action, like seeking out alternatives, appropriate emotions. So um, an example here might be if, you're, if you have the virtue, the intellectual virtue of open-mindedness, you might be really disappointed when you see your friend being dogmatic, say. Okay? And appropriate perceptions, noticing opportunities to seek out alternatives. Um, so, I think that intellectual values are plural. It's valuable to get truths, knowledge, and understanding. It's valuable to be motivated to get those goods. Um, and intellectual virtues are also plural. So, reliableist virtues require the production of truths, and responsiblest virtues require the motivation for truth. And I think that these virtues aren't com competitive. I think they complement one another. Um, in important ways. So I think because they complement one another, it's important for us to think about how to encourage our students to develop both of them, both reliable virtues and responsible virtues. So what I'm going to do is suggest some, some strategies for doing that. Okay. So um, again, the full, long, long-winded version of the paper is online. And in the, in the sort of first couple sections, I um, talk about, I handle some sort of objections to introducing responsible virtues into classes on logic and critical thinking. So the first part of the paper is really theoretical and sort of standardly philosophical and trying to respond to objections. The second part of the paper is the fun practical stuff, and that's what we're going to do. Um, so, so I want to say a tiny bit about um, general methods for developing the responsiblest virtues, as that has been talked about in the literature, so just to give you a little bit of background about this. And um, a lot of this is based on Aristotelian habituation, though there are lots of criticisms, right, good, important criticisms of Aristotelian habituation. It's largely thought that, um, and it's not like anybody has the ultimate answer to this, but most people think that in order to become more open-minded, to become more intellectually humble, how do we do it? It's going to involve a combination of formal instruction and exposure to exemplars, or maybe not exemplars, but people who are closer to having the virtue than you are, for yourself, and lots of practice, okay? Um, so what strategies should we use in developing responsible as virtues. In Aristotelian virtue ethics, 
so this is on the moral side. There's a long tradition of addressing the development of moral virtues. Aristotle famously argued that moral virtues are acquired by a combination of formal instruction, the imitation of exemplars, and practice. So in his view, formal instruction, like reading the Nicomachean Ethics, isn't going to be enough to make him morally virtuous, since formal instruction doesn't easily influence your emotions or motivations, right? So pure propositional knowledge, that's not going to get it. He's not an intellectualist. He's not Socratic in that way. At a minimum, we also have to imitate virtuous people and practice doing what they do. Um, so the structure of the responsibilist intellectual virtues, as we said, is analogous to the structure of the responsibilist moral virtues. Um, so if we sort of try to transpose Aristotle's analysis of habituation of moral virtues into the intellectual realm, right, into epistemology, it seems like responsibilist virtues are going to be acquired dispositions of appropriate intellectual action or behavior, intellectual motivation, and so on. Okay. Um, so Zygzewski argues along these lines. She says the stages of learning the responsibilist virtues, she says, are parallel to the stages of learning the moral virtues as Aristotle describes them. I'm not sure that Aristotle thinks these are stages, but we'll just go with that for the moment. Nothing hangs on it. So um, she says we begin with the imitation of virtuous persons, which require uh, virtuous persons. The virtues require practice, which develops certain habits of feeling and acting, and usually includes an in-between stage of intellectual self-control. Um, so really roughly, we begin to develop the virtue of open-mindedness by imitating and practicing the actions and emotions of an open-minded person, or at least somebody who's farther along than we are ourselves. We practice doing what they would do. So we practice imitating their behavior and feeling what they would feel in a wide range of situations. So for, for a virtue specifically like open-mindedness, what does that mean? Well, the activity that's characteristic of open-mindedness is considering the alternatives that are relevant in a particular situation. So that's what we practice. Um, Zygzewski thinks that although formal instruction can introduce us to the virtues, it can't provide us with any canned rules for virtuous action. And that's because there just aren't any canned rules, right? An open-minded person is going to behave differently in different situations. So an open-minded person isn't always going to consider every alternative, right? They're going to ignore some alternatives. Virtues lie in me, right? Um, Granted, we may initially imitate exemplars because we want to please our mentors or get external rewards like good grades. But Aristotelians think that with enough repetition and positive reinforcement, we'll not only learn to act and feel the way that virtuous people do, but to care about what they care about. That's, I think, an interesting and very controversial claim. In other words, we'll eventually consider appropriate alternatives not because we care about the external rewards, Write the praise or what have you, but because we care about truth for its own sake. As this intrinsic motivation strengthens, it will outweigh competing motivations and make it easier for us to do what an open-minded person would do. So Aristotelians think that with repeated practice, these kinds of actions and intrinsic motivations become stable character traits. Um, there's a really, um, really cool educational psychologist whose name is Ron Richards. He teaches at Harvard. Um, he's in Project Zero there. And he um, has sort of independently developed, um, independent really from uh, the development of virtue epistemology, independently, he doesn't base this on Aristotle in any explicit way. He's developed an analysis of, of acquiring intellectual virtues in middle school. Uh, that is very similar to Zygzewski's Aristotelian analysis. Um, so, like the responsibilist virtues, Ron Richard thinks that intellectual character traits are dispositions of action, motivation, emotion, and perception. Um, so, he thinks that in order for us to successfully facilitate the development of intellectual virtues in middle schools. We need a combination of formal instruction, exposure to exemplars, and practice on the part of the students. 
So rich heart with respect to formal instruction, the idea here is that not that we would be spending like weeks in a logic, well, if we apply it to university, not that we would be spending weeks in a logic or critical thinking class just like, you know, making, forcing students to read some exams or something. That's not the idea. Okay, the idea is that we give students a, um, a sort of overall framework of formal instruction. And so one of the things um, that I've actually done in my lower division logic class is I've pitched the class as a class that is about um, epistemic value and virtue in general. And by situating, um, so I pitch the class as a class that's about epistemic value and virtue in general, and then I say, okay, there's different things that are valuable from an epistemic point of view. One of the things that's valuable is getting truth and knowledge. And that's great, we have to do that. We want to do that, that's important. And another thing that's valuable is even if we sometimes can't do that, we care about, we care, we want uh, to be people who care about getting the truth, even if we fail, right? So what I try to do is pitch the class broadly as a class that's about epistemic value and virtue spend most of the class, because it is a logic class, on reliable virtues, and specifically on the category of reliable virtues that are logical skills. But then also spend, I think I spent about five class sessions in total in one semester. So in the US, we have like 15 weeks, so 30, class, we meet with our students 30 times. And so five of those times, we did something that had to do with open-mindedness, intellectual courage. And I think initially I spent two days, just two sessions, talking to my students about it, just giving them the rundown. Here's what the virtues are, right? So formal instruction, I think, need not be more than essentially an hour and a half, two hours of stuff with the students. Um, so, which part, I think, is right to point out that form formal instruction does play a useful role because it gives students a way of thinking about themselves and their character traits that they probably, well, that maybe they haven't been exposed to before. And so it helps them categorize something that's going on in themselves and something that they're going to be able to see in other people as well. So I think. Formal instruction is important, but it's clearly not going to be enough. And Rich Hart agrees. Um, so, and so does Aristotle. Um, so, in order for us to acquire the emotions that are connected with intellectual virtue, we're not going to get that through formal instruction. We might be able to get that in part by exposure to exemplars, by exposure to people who have the appropriate emotions, especially if we're willing to talk about emotional and catching emotions from other people within a classroom setting. Um, and then Rich Hart also emphasizes practice, right? And he, um, he actually, in his work, um, develops what he calls thinking routines, which are routines that get, um, they become, uh, common within a classroom atmosphere um, because of uh, what the teacher in, in part, <coughs> the way in which the teacher sets up the classroom. And students use them throughout the year. So for instance, a thinking routine that he's employed to try to encourage students to become more open-minded is to use the routine whenever they're confronting new information or they're, whenever they're trying to solve a problem, say what the problem is say why it's a problem, say other things to try. So say what, say why, say other things to try. So this is, you know, pitched at like sixth graders, right? Um, so the idea is to get them practicing the behavior that an open-minded person, or we're talking about a different virtue, an intellectually courageous person would perform, okay? Okay, so now the fight. Okay, so, um, so I think that, uh, if we're going to try to facilitate intellectual virtues at the university level, my proposal is that we use formal instruction.
often to explain the responsible virtues. We use exemplars or people who are closer to being exemplars to further elucidate the responsible virtues. We have to provide a lot of opportunities for students to practice identifying which actions a virtuous person would perform and which ones they wouldn't perform. Um, we can use exemplars to help our students experience virtuous emotions. It's really important for us to provide opportunities for students to practice performing virtuous behaviors themselves and to practice virtuous perception, noticing opportunities to behave the way an open-minded person behave or an intellectually courageous person behave. Okay. Um, so your handout is about your handout is about um, some strategies I've used in class to help students um, become better at identifying actions that an intellectually virtuous person would perform and actions that an intellectually virtuous person might not perform. Uh, and also to help them think about uh, what the motivations for those actions might be. Okay, so are some of you guys willing to play along here? Mark, can you be house? Sure. You'll be a fabulous house. <laughs> okay. So I'm here. Can you be forming? Yep. You can be forming. Okay. Um, Cameron. So I'll be Cameron. Adam, do you want to be Chase? Okay. Okay. All right, Mark, go. So let's figure out what's in the case that differential diagnosis people. Parasite? It's spreading too quickly. Next. <laughs> Virus. The kids are too sick. The blood test showed no lymphocytosis. And they are now responding to AC Cobra or Rick Cobra. You know, <laughs> yeah. It's not the virus, but they'll find it time anyway. It's not responding to broad spectrum antibodies. So we've got something resistant. Usual suspects? MRSA. It's always MRSA in our spreads. Maybe contaminated food or water source? Pseudomonas. VRE. Pitch flu? Okay, those are the big ones. Cultures will take 48 hours. Might as well be post mortem. We'll start on the fine of whatever. Bang of my Yeah, it's a hard With RSA and the asthma and the rest. Let's get MRIs to check the assets. It was a cold infection. Yeah, so the idea is that you guys, you guys are all very good sports.
that they're having about the drawing that Hannah put on the cover of her book. Okay, are you willing to be murdered? You're in! Okay, and I'll be half. Okay. Do you want to know about your book, Jackie? Lord Byron and Caroline Lamb, the Royal Academy, Ink Study by Henry Fuseli? What about it? It's not there. Who says? This uh, Fuseli expert in Byron's Society General. They say the ladies is a distinguished guest speaker. But of course it's them. Everyone knows. Popular tradition only. Here we are. No earlier than 1820. He's analyzed it. Analyzed it? Charming sketch, of course. Byron was in Italy. But Bird, I know it's that. How? How? It just is. Analyzed it by Big Toe. Language. He's wrong. Oh, that's instinct to me. He's wrong. So again, I think this is another example where we can um, use this and ask students what intellectual actions are being performed. Are these folks doing things that you think an intellectually virtuous person would be doing in this context or not, and why? And moreover, what are the motives? I think this is actually a really great case for looking at motivations. Um, okay. Uh, and then finally, one last case, and there's all, you, there, you can draw from all kinds of um, stuff here. But one last case is from Watson's Double Helix. Um, so Watson and Crick are um, credited with discovering the structure of DNA, but at the time that they were working, of course, at the time that they were working on this, there were other folks working on this too, so Maurice Wilkins and Russell and Franklin were working on it, and Linus Pauling was working on it at Caltech. So um, Linus Pauling's son was actually in the same lab as Watson and Crick. And um, Linus Pauling's son got an advanced copy of his father's paper that was about to be published. And so Watson and Crick got to see the paper, okay? And this is when Watson and Crick were still trying to figure out what the structure of DNA is. And so these are some excerpts from um, Watson's autobiographical account of the, how, they, how they discovered DNA, the double helix. And this, these are excerpts from their reaction to reading Linus Pauling's paper. So, here's what Watson says. At once, I felt something was not right. I couldn't pinpoint the mistake until I looked at the illustrations for several minutes. Then I realized that the phosphate groups in Linus's model were not ionized. Pauling's nucleic acid, in a sense, was not an acid at all. When Francis Crick was amazed equally by Pauling's unorthodox chemistry, I began to breathe slower. By then, I knew we were still in the game. The blooper was too unbelievable to keep secret for more than a few minutes. I dashed over to Roy Markham's lab to spurt out the news and to receive further assurance that Linus's chemistry was screwy. Markham predictably expressed pleasure that a giant had forgotten elementary college chemistry. Next, I hopped over to the organic chemists, where again I heard the soothing words that DNA was an acid. Back at the Cavendish, Francis was explaining that no further time must be lost on this side of the Atlantic. When his mistake became known, Linus would not stop until he captured the right structure. Since the manuscript had already been dispatched to the proceedings of the National Academy, by mid-March, the latest Linus's paper would be spread around the world. Then it would be only a matter of days before the error would be discovered. We had anywhere up to six weeks before Linus again was in full-time pursuit of DNA. Okay, yeah, it is. Yeah, it's a little damning. Now, to be fair, Right, I mean, so at the very end of this chapter, they actually go out to a pub and drink to celebrate Pauling's failure. <laughs> okay, but then there are, no, okay, so there are other, um, like, they're not, like, the, it's not all like this. Okay, so they, they do, they have multiple motives. So I think it's, like, one of their motives is clearly ambition. You know, they are ambition in a, in a very negative sense, right? That they want to be first. They want to win the Nobel Prize. That's what, that's their motive. Um, but the, I think they do also care about the truth. I think it wouldn't be right to say that they don't care about getting getting it right. Okay. So again, these are just some these are just some examples of different fields that I think it's actually it's really once once you have this on your radar, it's actually really easy to find these kind of examples out there in the real world. Um, so uh, just a couple of last things here. Um, I think, so these examples are ones that are healthy 
how they would be motivated, how they wouldn't be motivated. Um, it's really important to give students opportunities themselves to practice those actions. This is just getting them to be more familiar with the concepts and practice and identifying what a virtuous person would or wouldn't do. They, we need to give them opportunities to practice doing those things themselves. So one thing that I often do, and this is really easy to do in philosophy classes, you give students any, you know, sort of classic problem in philosophy, like the trolley problem or something like that. Okay, so you give students a classic problem in philosophy. It could be in any field. Like right? I've done this with internalism and externalism and epistemology. You can do it with really any issue where there's de clear debate on both sides. Okay. So you give students the trolley problem, and you, you put them in groups and ask them to discuss it. And you ask them, during the discussion, to do something that they think an open-minded person would do, right? And or do something that they think an intellectually courageous person would do. And then, right, and they, and they can do this and reflect on it quite well. Um, and then, after the discussion's over, you ask them things like, you tried to perform an open-minded act. Did you succeed or fail? Why or why not? Was it hard to be open-minded and intellectually courageous at the same time? Right? And these kinds of things. So I think there's actually lots of things we can do to encourage our students to practice doing what an intellectually virtuous person would do. And it doesn't even require extra stuff like this. Right? So um, once, once students have these sort of basic categories in mind of what the, what the responsibilities for Jews are, we can ask them to be on the lookout for, because all of us are already having discussions with our students in class, pretty much every class. All of us are assigning stuff for our students to do, okay, papers and so on. And so we can just, we can just maximize on the opportunities that we already have from discussions in class to ask students when they're participating in discussions to try to do something that, that an intellectually virtuous person would do. When they're writing papers to try to do something that an intellectually virtuous person would do. So there are things, special things we can add to make it more explicit, but we don't even have to do that, right? I think most of what we're already doing can be quite easily adapted to this uh, new approach, I think. Um, and then just lastly, finally, so I think um, in those kinds of cases, one worry about, well, there's two main worries about those kinds of cases. Um, one is, is that, look, right, in these cases, it's all set up by the faculty member, okay, right? We're, you know, the faculty member is the ones who are designing these ready-made opportunities that are going to be offered up to the students. And we're going to say to the students, okay, now think about intellectual action in this context. What would a virtuous person do in this context, right? But I think that, um, and the problem with that is it doesn't give them an opportunity to practice perceiving when it's appropriate to perform an intellectually virtuous action or not. They're, the way they see the world might not change. Right? The way they, they might be able to notice when it's appropriate even within class, but outside of class, they walk out the door, they might not notice. Okay? That, that, the, that, that skill might just be dropped at the classroom door. So one thing I've actually done with my students with some success, with, with my intro logic students and my early vision of epistemology students, is I've had them participate in what I call virtue week. Right? And it's all transparent. Like, it's very, and I just say to them, you know, and I say right up front, you know, I am not by any means fully intellectually virtuous. I'm often a critic, right? I, I often suffer from intellectual weakness of will. Um, and so I'm going to try to become more virtuous too. So, Virtue Week is an opportunity for the students to actually sort of keep track of and try to perform actions that they think an intellectually virtuous person would perform. Um, and, at the, and, and try to practice the motivations an intellectually virtuous person would have. And at the end of the week, they write a paper. 
The papers are hilarious. Um, and, uh, and, and quite forthright. Um, and so, and, and so um, many students will say um, that they, you know, like one of their coworkers or family members was being homophobic, say, right? And they try to exercise open mindedness in this context. Or they, right? So they're like, they, lots of examples like that, okay? Lots of examples like that. Um, interestingly, they're forthright about their motivations, too. Which is fabulous. So they will often say things like, well, I only really did this because I knew I was going to get graded on the paper. Right? And that's, and that's, and that's, right? And that's important because, as Mark pointed out a couple days ago, right, it's not for responsible spurgy, we don't just want um, students to care about truth, right, for, for the immediate goal of getting a good grade or something. We want them to actually care about truth in a way that's more intrinsic, right? We want them to value truth intrinsically. And we're not saying that trivial truths are intrinsically valued or anything like that, but, but important truths. We want them to value intrinsically. So um, that is a drawback of this kind of method. Um, so I, I don't think that this, this overall method is, you know, I think there are problems. I have by any means figured out how all well this is supposed to work. Um, but I think that by at least starting to introduce some of these strategies into our lower vision classes on logic and critical thinking, we can help students make some progress toward it.